And so what we actually have is a pad in the, in the plants. It's an electronic pr- pressure pad. And if you stood on that, I could tell you exactly what your ground bearing pressure is mm-hmm. of the, your heel versus your toe. It, you'd have this really cool picture of your yep. shoe, right? It's like Dr. Scholl. <laughs> that's it, literally, that's exactly yeah. what it is. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> yep. Ladies and gentlemen, farmers, ranchers, and distinguished guests, thank you for listening to the Farm for Profit podcast, where we discuss the latest ideas, methods, trends, and techniques available to help your farm achieve higher levels of farm profitability. The Farm for Profit podcast is co-hosted by Tanner Winterhoff, the Iowa Bankerman, and David Whitaker, the Iowa Land Guy, where in tandem they will share their ideas and advice from industry experts. Thank you again for listening to the Farm for Profit podcast. Remember, if you aren't farming for profit, you won't be farming for long. And now, here's Tanner and David. All right, welcome back to another Farm for Profit episode of the Farm for Profit podcast. This is Tanner Woodroff. And this is David Whitaker. I said that very specifically because we know we get new listeners every single time. So this is a profit format. We start with an introduction, hit a what's working in ag segment, then roll through a general topic to help your farm achieve higher levels of profitability, and wrap that up with a conclusion and a challenge. In our fun shows, we take a little bit less structured format, have a couple of drinks, meet somebody tied to agriculture, and kick back. And thanks again to all our listeners for suggesting topics to talk about every week. Uh, get those to Tanner. Send those to farm the number four profit LLC at gmail.com. And of course, Tanner, we love for everybody to check out our social media channels, whether it's TikTok, Facebook, Twitter, uh, whatever it may be. Again, farm the number four profit. Yes, and thank you for sharing this with your friends and family. We really appreciate you helping grow our network, and part of that are the reviews that you leave us. So thank you, Gearinghoff, for your continued support, and it is now time for a head-of-the-class listener review. We have Lexi Jo Moore joined us. She said, I am a very big fan of the Farm for Profit podcast and Farm for Fun, which is done by the same guys. They make it entertaining to listen to, but get deep into some stuff that everybody should hear. And at one point, that's why we were deemed the Mullet of Agriculture podcast. We, of course, have the business in the front, Farm for Profit, and the party in the back, Farm for Fun. So thank you, thank you for leaving those reviews and joining us. So let's roll right into that What's Working in Ag segment, Dave. You bet. So we got Eggstorm Equipment with us today, and Eric and Ben are on the line with us. Welcome. How are you guys? Uh, Great. How are you guys? We're very good. So, uh, Eric, I'll talk with you first. Uh, tell me a little bit, what's your tie to agriculture? Let's see here. You know, I am the, I'm the sales manager for uh, the company. <clears throat> I, both my parents grew up on farms in southwest Minnesota. And uh, <clears throat> I, which tied me into Ben here, um, who uh, owns the company. We uh, actually go back a long ways, back into, you know, high school, best friends from high school and middle school. You know, spent a lot of time out on the farm with him, helping him screw around in the shop, you know, welding stuff together. And we love tractors and we love uh, making new equipment. That's kind of where we, where I come in. Awesome. And Ben, why don't you give a little bit of your background? Obviously, the two of you have been connected for a little while, but how, uh, yeah. what are you up to and how did you start the company? Uh, you know, I grew up on a farm in south central Minnesota over by St. Peter. Um, and egg has been a legacy in my family for a long time going back as far as, I guess, our heritage traces. And I, I so grew up around it, but I always knew I wanted to be an inventor and develop products from a pretty young age. So that's kind of where we come into the to the egg market, not only with actual farming, but with developing products that work for farmers. So that's been our passion for a long time. So we have paid partners, paid sponsors as part of this episode. And I want it to be very clear that these gentlemen are not paying to be on this episode. We found these products, and I can't believe I haven't seen these products before now. And they are just awesome, Dave. They are. I, I tell you, looking on the website uh, for you guys, eggstorm.com uh, there, uh, it's egg, it's eggstormequipment.com. But uh, I, I was, when Tanner brought this up, I was looking at the hydro box and uh, looking at the field seal and, and I uh, fancied a weld and invent stuff myself. And I thought, wow, this is fantastic. And it, it melds right into the equipment. It looks factory. It looks awesome. 
So guys, we are in a medium to where people are listening to this and they can't necessarily see what we're talking about. So will you do your best to describe what the Hydra Box is for our listeners? You know, I tell you what, Tanner, our Hydra Box is the last rock box you will ever buy for your tillage tractor. Hands down, it is the uh, the most efficient, most effective method of grabbing rocks when you're out in the field each spring and fall and doing, you know, spring and fall tillage. Um, it's all hydraulic. It's controlled from a controller that goes up in the cab with you. It's got three buttons on it. You know, we can try to make this as simple as possible. And it, the thing can lift about 5,000 pounds, but can also lift softball size, you know, rocks, no problem. You know, it just, this whole assembly is, goes on the front of the tractor and it just, the arm extends out to the left and you open the clop and it'll go down into the soil, you know, about three feet at least and then you can grab anything you can get those claws around so for those of our listeners that can't see what i'm seeing uh if you can visualize a normal rock box on the front of a uh, tractor but then it also has an articulating hydraulic arm that reaches off the side of the tractor with a grapple on it uh, almost like your hand and will claw out there with a simple controller grab that rock and bring it back and put it in the rock box with you never leaving the cab that's what i'm talking about this is awesome, and I've seen the videos. That That's the other thing, guys, is is they have videos out there on YouTube, on their website. The fun part for me, having been the rock picker this spring, is that box hydraulically dumps. You got that right. I don't have to manually do that anymore. This will hydraulically dump. So even if I got that big-ass rock in there, now I don't have to worry about getting it back out again. If you've ever had back problems, Tanner, this will be a godsend for you. You never have to get your ass out of the tractor cab to pick up another rock again. So you, you, you mentioned that this is part of your tillage tractor, but I think when I cruised out on the website, you have UTV options too, don't you? Yep. Yeah, we do. Yeah. So the, the concept is, you know, get them while you're there and make it convenient. You know, you always run into those rocks out there, but the UTV box is – just a handy thing because as we all know everybody has utvs and they're just slick you drive out there you pick up a rock and we've actually been able to make a system that you can lift a pretty good size rock with with your utv where historically it's what you could pick up and a lot of times it's young kids and stuff running that so just had a group chat with iowa farmer blake a friend of the podcast who was showing that his gator was just filled, he called them dinosaur eggs, just filled with dinosaur eggs, and he'd been you know, busted in his back all afternoon to pick things up with his gator. <laughs> this would have been uh, something that would have saved him an awful lot. So guys, yeah. what, what we're always talking about on Farm for Profit is how to be more profitable, and that's why you're on What's Working in Ag. I, Tanner, I, I just see this as a time saver. So when we say time is money and getting out there, even if it's something that you could task your kids with in that side-by-side or you could uh, have on the front of your tractor and you don't have to uh, pull it back all out and you can hydraulically dump it, uh, why is this on What's Working in Ag? Because we feel this is a time saver for you, a back saver, and, and furthermore, just with that one product. Now they have other products. Yeah, I was going to say, this is what drew our attention in, and then I had to almost like splash Dave with cold water to get him to stop sweating when he saw the field seal. (laughs) Can you guys give us an idea of what the field seal is for our listeners? Well, the field seal, you know, we realized that there, it wasn't like a fully waterproof and dustproof um, toolbox on the market anywhere. You know, so we wanted to come out with the first 100% waterproof and dustproof toolbox, and we did in our field seal line, and every every one of our customers couldn't be happier. You know, we also made it, you know, so it looks good on the front of your combines or on the front of your tractors or on the side of your combines. You know, it looks like it's meant to be there, and it's just it's virtually bulletproof. It's indestructible. It's made out of quarter-inch powder-coated steel, the whole thing, and it's fully customizable. I mean, uh, we can put one on anything, basically, and it's just taken off. So, Tanner, I know a lot of farmers have a uh, Montezuma box in the back of their truck or if they have, like, a a, a farm vehicle that's going to go yeah. out there. I just got one off the TBF auction that's so right. I can be one of you guys. Th- this is similar to is, is what I'm going to – if you're a farmer out there and you know what that is, where the lid closes and it keeps everything tight, this is similar except waterproof, weatherproof, and it looks like it's part of the tractor, so it looks custom. Yeah, it's it's really the only toolbox that is designed for the machines in the field. And, I mean, the reason it 
the, the reason that we designed it was because, you know, I, like I said, guys farm and running a combine. And I, I think one day I was just extremely frustrated looking for a 10 millimeter wrench is not that, you know, you guys, it was that damn tin. <laughs> it, 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 it was just, it was one of those moments where it was like, you know what, this is ridiculous. We're going to make the best toolbox that's ever been made. And that's what I've had my sights set on ever since. And, you know, none of them are like Eric said, none, none of them are, sealed none of them are waterproof um they kind of claim to be montezuma claims to be god bless them they sell a lot of toolboxes but they don't compare i mean it's the yeti toolbox or the yeti cooler of toolboxes yeah and the other thing before we send you guys on down the road is Corey, our fellow co-host on our farm for fun episodes had pointed out to me that you have track cleaners and having spent most of my falls in a track tractor pulling a grain cart that was something that I had never thought of before, but I think that's ingenious. Can you explain to our listeners what your track cleaners do? Yeah, it's dead simple, really. The track wheels on any of the two-track tractors, John Deere or Ch- Agco's Challenger, have this big curled-over lip, and it, it retains all the dirt and mud and rocks and whatever else gets in that lip, and it wears the paint off the rims. And... Um, this is just ridiculous, and we were sick of that on our own farm and designed a product that eliminated that. And, you know, I always compare it to if you bought a Maserati and the rims wore out in a year, you'd probably be going back to the dealer. Yeah. <laughs> and we spend probably more on a on those tillage tractors than we do on Maserati, so truth be known. But <laughs> I like the mentality and the personality that I'm getting out of this, is if, if you guys found something on your farm that could have been better or could have been done differently or more efficiently, you just said, I'm going to make the damn thing. Yep. Yep. That's the name of the game with us. We're an innovation company. I mean, we're still getting the rocket put on the launch pad, guys. I, I mean, if I can say one thing on this, it's please uh, you know, keep an eye on us because we're not stopping for anything. We want to design products, good products, and we're getting better at it every day. Well, so. perfect. Perfect. Hey, guys, we really like your product. We think it's what's working an egg. Uh, ben and Eric, uh, if one of you could give me give me your contact, where can people find you, uh, website and, and a phone number if you want? Well, I'll tell you what, guys, if you just want to come look us up online at our eggstormequipment.com, that's where we have a lot of our featured products. Or, uh, you know, give us a call at 507-995-2321. That's uh that's the sales line, and we'll get you all set up and answer any questions uh you, you have. All right, and I think Eric, you've got to have one of the easiest jobs being the sale man sales manager for products <laughs> that pretty much are going to sell themselves once people see them. Give that phone number one more time for us before we sign off. I tell you what, I love my job, Tanner. That's why it makes it so much fun. The, the number is five zero seven nine nine five two three two one. Thanks, gentlemen, for joining us on our What's Working in Ag segment this week. Well, guys. Thanks, guys. We're going to roll right into our general topic for you listeners. Here we go. That was a great What's Working in Ag segment. Now, thank you to Ag Leader for their sponsorship of this podcast. They have a solution for every season. Their products and solutions help you integrate your entire farm all year round. Use their products to seamlessly connect your equipment and tasks so that your operation runs more efficiently than ever before. So thank you, Ag Leader, for joining us on the Farm for Profit podcast. Let's roll right into our general topic, and I've got Corey joining me today, filling in as Dave's got a, a couple of professional obligations today. Why don't you go ahead and uh, start off this general topic with an introduction for our guest? Yeah, thanks for having me, stepping up to the big leagues here. It's a nice change of pace. Today we've got Scott Sloan with us. If you're on Ag Twitter at all, you probably know him. Scott is from the Des Moines, Iowa area and graduated from the University of Northern Iowa. He is currently the Ag Product Manager and Global LSW for titan international inc scott has worked for titan for over 21 years and is with us today to talk all things tires welcome scott well thanks for having me guys thanks for joining us no and, and by like the way you. and by the way go panthers just so <laughs> yeah. you, i don't know where I like you guys you and are I. Right. all right all right i don't have any problem with you and i we're cyclone fans the, the I, hawkeyes I, can go I, somewhere else i am uh my son is graduating on monday or uh saturday from uh, iowa state in materials engineering mm-hmm. and uh i went to you and i am the youngest of five and the only one that didn't go to Iowa. So I was at the kid <laughs> at Thanksgiving at Christmas, quietly rooting against Chuck Long and sure. all that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, rebel. And, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's funny. Well, thank you for joining us today, Scott. We are talking about tires, but really around the topic of soil compaction. We're rolling right out of spring. A lot of the crop went in the ground a couple weeks ago. But 
ultimately we now know potentially what kind of harm we did to our fields running the planters across running our tillage tools across rollers everything as this all puts together so it's going to be fresh in our listeners mind so that's why we got you here today and yeah. thanks for yep. joining us. you bet absolutely glad, I'm glad to be here so what i what i dug up is is generally good soil contains about 25 percent water 25 percent air by volume this 50 percent is referred to as poor space the remaining 50 percent consists of the soil particles any wheel traffic that reduces that pore space results in dense soil or compacted soil so that that's what we're talking about today is trying to keep as much air and as much moisture in the soil correct to help that crop roll right Corey? that sounded like what uh, came out of my soils 101 you know, I don't <laughs> yeah, know, you know what? I'm, so. I'm gonna take your word for it right. on the organic matter on that <laughs> I, i'm just the tire guy here but yeah. uh, it, that is the i say textbook definition I mean, I can, com- compaction right i can there. tell you from the farm side you know if you got a big heavy something going through the field when it's a little too wet nothing grows there very that's good exactly right that's exactly right well there you go way to simple it down for us <laughs> <laughs> and, and the reason being is probably because it's hard for the roots to get through well i was gonna ask so what why does compaction hurt soil yield well just like you said you know that the uh, amount of air and and just the particle sizes and the the density of that you know, they call it bulk density, actually, of the of that soil. It, it limits that that plant from growing. So if you have a nice, soft, fluffy bed, you know, like strip tillers, that's why strip tillers are so, yep. so big because they literally, it's tilled up and it's just that nice, fresh, soft soil, like your potting soil that you get. Those roots have a really good chance of taking off and, go, and going. Um, you know, honestly, rain causes compaction. Yeah. So... Uh, it's the number one contributor to compaction. And then you've got your wheel tracks and, and those kind of all add up on that. So uh, the more you can keep the, the soil loosened up and and uh, non-compacted, the better chance that root system has to take off and, and get going. Yeah, And I think on the opposite side of that, a no-tiller would say, well, they're building soil structure. Exactly. Right? And then they have pores from roots that are living in the soil and right. going down and all that. So, I mean, it's... And they have minimized passes. Yes. So, they're not taking that... You know, you think about it, you're taking a you know a 20-ton vehicle across a, a field, and it's got to, that compaction has got to go someplace. Yeah. So. yeah, I would say tillage practices and then even soil types, just based upon your Absolutely. geography of where you're at, you probably have some soils that are more susceptible to compaction than others. Absolutely. And, and that's probably going to drive a lot of the decisions on whether you go no-till or whether you're on tracks or on a different type of tire technology to help minimize, you know, the negative aspects of compaction. Right. And, and you know, no-tillers, it, the, the concept is that organic matter in the in the soil. So the, the more organic matter is, the less compactable material there is in that. And it gives the, that plant an opportunity to actually, again, get started, get off to a good start. Yep. yep. So that's that probably is is a big factor. Also, is moisture. So clearly, sometimes you're very fortunate. This spring, we've been very dry in our area. And I'm just going to say that uh, this year is probably going to be very minimal issues with compaction. Even you know, depending on what your your type of farming is or your operation is, uh, this year has been. You know, I've talked to guys; they can't even get the the closing wheels to close the the. Uh, the trench, the trench, yep. because it's so dry, mm-hmm. and they just ran a you know a planter and a tractor over it, and they still can't get it to close. So, yeah. you know, good for them, and you know, good for this year. But there's other years when, you know, what was it last year? Uh, it was well, I guess the two years ago it was so wet we didn't yep. get until, you know, didn't get in until June that's, on some of that because it was so wet. That's typically what we deal with around Iowa is too wet. And so, especially in the spring, I would say so. That is normally what we're fighting. This spring is a completely different animal. Um, I don't think I've ever planted into such a dust bowl before. In fact, I was looking at a bunch of acres before this. We're trying to figure out when to plant some corn on corn. Well, last year we had the derecho that knocked some corn down. So now we're trying to manage our volunteer, which we probably should have just went soybeans in the first place. But, you know, whatever, that's not that's out of the question now. But the only thing, the only volunteer corn that had been germinated was in wheel tracks. Everything else didn't have good enough soil, seed to soil contact. Isn't that something? Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, you see the darndest things out there. <laughs> so, and Corey and I are in a couple of group chats that we've got a friend of ours that hasn't been able to get into the field because they've been getting rain. So most of the Midwest is dry this year. Like I said, the the compaction will be very minimal yep. due to the the moisture in the soils. But other than that, that is something we typically have to pay attention to every spring. Absolutely. You know, and, and there's tire technology that's out there now, essentially, is what you're trying to do is, you know, ground bearing pressure, right? So how much how much pound per square inch are you carrying that tractor and that planter over those over those fields? And 
you know, there's concepts of, you know, row crop or you go to a super single type concept. There's a lot of different different technologies out there that are very beneficial to, to spreading that load out. You know, uh, cattle, grazing cattle, right? terrible for compaction. Yep. There were, even in dry conditions, you know, I was just up in Wisconsin, and there was all kinds of cattle grazing in, in cornfields that hadn't been planted yet. And I'm just thinking to myself, you know, that they're... They're hurting themselves by doing that, but you know it's it's just the way it, it is. Well, their cattle is probably their main. Income, yeah, then this know? is true and, too. And they're just trying to grow feed for yeah, exactly. them. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah. you're right. The pounds per square inch on that hoof. Exactly. That's why they call it much a, more. One of those drums, uh, those big compacting drums, a sheep's foot. Sheep's foot. Yep. You know exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so. Yep. So then, in your mind, Scott, what implement in a standard farming operation causes the most compaction in the field? Well, that's a kind of a tough question because you've got uh, you've got a tractor that weighs you know if you've got a mechanical front you got a tractor that weighs thirty five to forty thousand pounds that you, you got to carry across the field. But the the big thing is um, is your planters uh, that planter tracks because it's running right between the rows, right next to the row. And, and we've now got bulk fill planters, so all that weight. There's a lot, and you know, and the, unfortunately, the tire that are on there now are actually for the most part a truck tire. So you're looking at a a hundred. 110 psi in those tires and that's just to carry the that planter when it's in transport now when you unfold that you know technically you could probably drop that that tire down to 35 40 psi but you know you know the central inflation systems and things like that that are coming on that's where those become beneficial because farming is a is a a compromise because you're not going to have a guy go out and set inflation pressures for 20 minutes before he goes into the field to get it to that optimum and then do as 150 acres and then leave the field and then pump air back into those yep. tires. There's really not anybody that I know that would be able to do that or and, would be willing to do that. And I want to portray this. I, I've done some work with a with a competitor of yours. So the reason... What? Yeah, with the, the reason why... <laughs> the reason why <laughs> oh. you have to have those that PSI when you're going down the road is because that planter is folded up. Yep. It's got probably two pro boxes, 5,000 pounds of seed in it, and then it's they might have a fertilizer tank sitting on the center tongue that has 500 gallons. So you're looking at 4,000, 5,000 pounds. And then the weight of that planter, there's no wheels in between the hitch of that planter. Right. You can add up to, up to 12, 13,000 pounds on your hitch just in a folded so, up position because, and the rest of it is back on those transports. So you need that PSI to go down the road. Right. Otherwise, you're going to destroy those, exactly. those tires, right? Exactly. But then when you unfold, yes, there's still a lot of weight, but then those are all on the gauge wheels. And, and everything like it, that. It does distribute it, yep. So, and, you know, so the, the, again, the, the thing is, is as you take the, the load off the tire, your footprint gets smaller. Yep. So, although you may not have the load on it, you're concentrated now is to a smaller patch. So, when you can deflate that tire, then your footprint grows. So and that's where you're carrying, although it be a lighter weight, you're getting more inches on the ground to, to help with the capacity. So, what technology has, has do you guys have that has come about? to get rid of that oh we got it all you got it all <laughs> <laughs> um, you already mentioned his competitor what type yeah, of answer know. were you expecting <laughs> uh no i'm just saying oh yeah there's a lot of good technology out there with everyone so it's it's interesting but like I, i'm thinking of if tires yeah, or, exactly you know if and vf technology so it, for those that don't know what if and vf is so if is, is stands for increased flexion um vf stands for very high flexion Okay, so I always use analogy, and this is kind of what my job is: is to go out and trying to talk to farmers and talk to implement dealers and talk to, to tire dealers. But so if if you can imagine a, a standard tire, just to make the numbers easy for me, anyway, the you had a tire that carried a hundred pounds of load at a hundred psi, mm-hmm. right? That'd be the standard tire. An IF tire tells you that you can carry that same hundred pounds at 20% less or 80 pounds uh, of inflation pressure to carry that same 100. Yep. Now you take the VF tire, now that's 60 pounds, so, so 40% less. So it's a deflection technology. So what manufacturers have done is we've made design changes to the tire, I and mean, there's a lot that goes into it, but what we're allowing that tire to do is run lower at lower inflation pressures. And when you do that, right, that footprint, you, a flat tire, you get a bigger, get it right. lengthened. Yep. Um, it doesn't get any wider because it's just as wide as tread, but it allows that tire to grow lengthwise. And by doing that, you're spreading that. You're going from, you know, 
say, 100 square inches on the ground to maybe 200 square inches on the ground to carry that same exact load. So yep. that's where the distributing that that load across that footprint is. So I'm I'm thinking of like an old wagon tire, and when you lower that thing down, it kind of it's just a big. I mean, it goes in all directions, right? Yep. It goes wider and yep. and longer. Yep. Whereas you're talking these these things going on, a, especially on a planter. You can't go wider. Don't right. want it. You don't right. want it. You so don't it's it. lengthening. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So, you know, implement IF and VF implement tires are, are relatively new. Um, honestly, if somebody told me that we were going to be looking at radial tires on a on an, a planter or, or an implement of any type like seven to ten years ago, I would have laughed in their face just because the cost, right? The farmers just don't want to pay for that extra mm-hmm. on it when they're going to use it, you know, two weeks out of the year. Um, so that was you know, kind of a, a breakthrough there. And now we've gotten to the radial tires and now we've gotten to the IF and VF implement tires, which is, it's the same concept, whether it's on an implement tire or a, or a tractor tire where, um, we're allowing that tire to deflect more run flatter basically so, is what it's doing. So explain what the difference of like a radial versus it'd be like, what a bias, a bias tire. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, you know, bias tire is the, the, the original, the original ag tire that you see today. And, um, if you can imagine the hole in the tire where the the rim is, right? Mm-hmm. On a bias tire, if you took the cord, that, that, that nylon cord that's in the tire, and it went up and over, it would end up about 180 degrees on the other bead of the tire. So in the in the sidewall of the tire, the the, the plies are crisscrossed. They're at a they're at an angle like that. And that's why sometimes you, you hear it as a, a bias tire or a diagonal tire is another okay. um, you'll see a D designation on some sizes like a 1250 45 d32 so okay. that is diagonal now a radial tire if you got that same hole in the tire it, that radial that core goes straight up and over radially so it's on the exact same side okay. of the of the tire radially so on the sidewall of the tire you've got this this cords going straight up and over so that's the radial and then we put stabilizer belts on the top of that tire that's what kind of manages the od in the footprint so in a radial tire if you think about it you got the belt package in there and that's just like your pasture light truck stuff it's same technology okay um the, the tread and the sidewall actually work separately so the treads kind of or the sidewalls kind of flexing but that that belt package is actually what controls the holds the, the shape holds the shape exactly in a bias tire <clears throat> it's just like if you took a a tennis ball and pushed it up to a plate of glass the center of the tire right and that's it's like why a balloon. It's almost. just a, yeah. it, the tread and the sidewall are, are literally the same thing. Yep. So uh, the the uh, inflation pressures are, are generally higher, and wear is a little bit more severe on a, on a bias tire if it gets roaded a lot. So that's why everybody went jumped to radials on tractors and sprayers because it just wears better in a larger footprint. And I can see why the radial makes sense on a planter because we would we would rather control. I'm going to call it the left and right of the tread we want to stay in that tread pattern we can elongate our our compaction pain we don't want to get any closer to the plants that we're putting in the ground we'd like to keep the compaction that we are causing as far away from that root system you know as possible. and that's a challenge and that's not only with planters but all equipment so you know obviously in order to stay within that let's just say let's just say a, a 30 inch row right yep. the standard just in order to stay within that row right we have a width limitation yep so the only way that you can get a tire to have a larger footprint, right, is one, let a little bit of air out of the tire and you get to a certain point. But it, even if that's not enough, then you got to start looking at larger diameter tires. Yep. But the problem is, is manufacturers were kind of stuck in this architecture of the machine. So you've got frames on planters, very tight restrictions. Yep. So they're trying yep. to put, you know, all this other stuff on these planters, but they're not giving us any more room to put a, a tire so size. You're, I always tell manufacturers, you know, you're one model year away from going right back to the inflation pressures that you're at the year before. Yeah. Just because they keep throwing stuff on it, and air does carry the load. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a challenge, and that's where you see. I'm going to say that I'm going to say that the T word tracks um, <laughs> have become <laughs> have become more and more popular, and you're seeing them more on you know DB planters and yep. th- those types of things because. Yep. What that allows them to do is it's a mechanical thing. So you're going like a caterpillar, right? So you can run that basically the length of that planter if you wanted to yeah. right, and carry that load. And that is that is an advantage. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, you know, the technology out there to try and minimize that compaction on a planter is, you know, everything from 
you know, IF and VF implement tires to tracks to, I'm waiting for the, like the hoverboard type of, you know, where it's a, uh, just floating on air yeah. running through the field. Yeah. I mean, you know, That'd be all right. Yeah. 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 Well, that, that's a trend, too. I don't see these implements getting lighter. You know, I, I've yet to have a manufacturer come up and say, hey, you know what? I got this great idea for this new piece of equipment. It's going to be 15 miles an hour slower and, and weigh 10,000 pounds less. It's I think, just, the, yeah, the it, only way that's going to go is if you get on one of these autonomous right. you know, deals. Well, you know, and, and that's kind of the concept, too, is uh, this the high-speed planners, right? Mm-hmm. The, you're, you're going twice as fast, so you can have actually a smaller machine and your productivity would relatively remain the same right yep. if you're got a 24 row planner and you're going you know four miles an hour and you've got a 12 row planner and you're going eight miles an hour your productivity is the same but you're a lot less weight to carry and and uh compaction issues like that so you know uh, we kind of kid about that but i think you're going to see a trend on equipment where it is going to become smaller and lighter and you know autonomous stuff you talked about autonomous stuff yeah. uh, that is right around the corner yep. And I, I think that's going to make a, a big impact in, in our industry when it comes yeah. to, to this. Well, so, so back to that speed comment before you move on to the next. Clearly, the laws of physics tell you that a pound being a per square inch applied to the ground is going to be the same no matter you're going 4 mile an hour or 10 mile an hour. But is there an advantage for driving faster for spending less time nope, on that soil? Nope. That's a good point. Uh, and that's kind of the thing with the track. So duration. That would be the duration on the ground. So if... You know, if you think about it, you roll your hand over real slow or you, like that, as long as you got that same pressure, technically you would com- be compacting less if you rolled across, across there faster because you, it has less time to s- basically settle. Right. Um, so that's always kind of my uh, my gig on the that T word again is the duration that that track is actually on the ground is longer, longer. Than, yeah. than just the one pulse of the tire through the field. With uh, I will say one of the advantage in my mind, Maybe it's just my opinion, though. Like, and this is from agronomy class at Iowa State. Ninety percent of a compaction is done the first pass. Yep. Right. So, as long as you stay in that, what do we call it, a tram line, control or traffic, whatever, control you, you traffic, know, control traffic yeah. you have that planter following the tractor tires and all that. Hopefully, you're compacting less. Right. Which, and, that's, and it's the price of doing. You know, you guys will give that up as a price of doing business, right? I mean, you, you, you got to get that equipment across the field. But just like you were saying, the the tram lines and control traffic is a, a great way of minimizing that because in, in, you know, with the, you know, GPS now, I mean, you're within an inch, inch and a half yep. uh, as, yep. as far as accuracy. So, so I've seen pictures though of guys that have their planner set up and the planner tractor has a uh, front wheel assist tractor and then it's missing the inside dual and they're only running the outside dual. Is, is there a theory between trying to put weight between these two rows, weight between rows five and six, and then the planner follows in behind? Uh, I don't know. I, I think because you're you're going to double up on rows five and six on right. the. On I, was, the I think the theory of the tram line. If why, if I'm going to compact well, the soil, let's just do it all in one row. Well, and I even you know was lay at bed at night, right, and staring at the ceiling and wondering the next tire tech line. I don't know if you guys do that, but uh, every night, <laughs> yep, that's normal. I wonder what the next tire tire tech line. But you know, go narrower, right? Minimize the and take the inflation pressures up high, and then just like you were saying, is, that's just the price of doing business, and right. you minimize how much you're you're running over and give up that spot and then continue to run in it, then you're, you know, probably it would be interesting to see how that would go. I would almost bet that they're probably set up on 120-inch centers at that point, and yep. they're going to follow it with their sprayer because we have actually sprayed off of the planter tracks before. And if you get in the wrong conditions mm-hmm. and get in soft fields with those, like especially like on a Hager or a High Boy sprayer that has narrow tires, um, if you get off the planter tracks, it'll suck you one way or the other. So it's better almost to drive on the compacted so you, I mean, mm-hmm. right. you can fly yeah. at that point. Yeah, so. absolutely. Right. So Corey mentioned that he is he's worked with somebody in the past to kind of help him figure out the inflation on the planter or tire technology for the sprayer, whichever it is. Why is it important for our listeners who we talk about advisory teams all the time, we talk about how they can achieve higher levels of profitability, what would be the advantage of working with a tire guy before you start planting every spring to come out and check pressures and check loads and, and, and do that? What would be an advantage? Knowing exactly what you got. So, uh, again, the, the education side of this is, you know, the last thing somebody thinks about when they start their day, I always kid people, you know, in my talks is, you know, you go out in the morning, right? You check the oil, you check the gas, and you check the air in the tires, right? Yep. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. <laughs> so I, I, have them, I, I have them raise their hand, you know, who, who checks their air every time they, they 
change an implement or they get up in the morning and nobody. It's usually once or twice a season. If it's even that, if it, if it looks okay getting rolled out of the shed, yeah, right. it's good until it's, it's a problem. It's right, a, it's visual. Right, it's a visual. It's, it's, is it squatting you know, or not? Yeah, you know, it's got two lugs on the ground or four lugs, whatever the you know whatever Grandpa said it was, right? Yeah. With a bias tire, so you don't even know where that even came yeah. from. But growers would be very surprised of what they could gain. You know, we got all this. You know, I call it fancy schmancy IF and VF technology, but on certain applications like let's say mechanical front wheel drives if the guy just managed his inflation pressures he could be driving at the same you could be running six psi and and nine psi on a on a mechanical front wheel drive on a 480 80r 50 or a 480 90r 50 uh size which is like the most common rear um but we go back to that planter situation where you fold up right and now you've got this planter that's that's Put so much tongue weight. You know, 12,000 pounds on that tongue weight. So you, let's say you got to have those tires at 23 PSI to, to carry, get, it, get it to the field, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't want to run low tires because then you start ripping things up. But then when you unfold that, right, you take all that off of there, you technically on uh, those tires, you could take it down to 6, 7, 8 PSI. But again, who's going who's gonna to sit there and, and do that? Um, that's, that is the major issue right there is you got to give something up if you know you're going to save time by not putting inflation you know uh, air in the tires yep. but you're also going to possibly lose a little bit on the on the compaction side because you're not you're not getting full advantage of the of the deflection of yep. that tire so if are you there go the other way you're going to gain in your footprint but then you're going to be buying a set of tires next year exactly right. exactly you know and the ninth thing about um if and vf is is you know that guy that has to carry it at say 23 psi on a standard tire you know, he could be running at like 17 PSI. So you might gain a few uh, pounds per, you know, PSI, pounds per square inch in the tire. But, you know, again, once that's folded out, if he's not dropping it down to the same inflation pressure that you'd be running a standard tire, you're gaining it for the road. I, you know, I, I don't know. So that's do it. inflation systems exist? So Maybe. could could somebody mount something on the tongue of a planter Absolutely. or a tractor? They will. I My prediction. Mark the calendar today. <laughs> hey, we're uh, good at this. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's coming. You know, in Europe, it's, it's extremely popular. They've got a lot more restrictions in, you know, for roading and, and things like that. So uh, there's tracking manufacturing. You know, Fent offers uh, CTIS is on their tractors now. Very, it's costly, right? But I think in, the, in North America here, the central inflation systems are coming on there's a couple of companies out there and i don't know we'll that. have to ask jenny because i'm pretty sure in deer's big rollout they did they the, had a, yep, a central the, inflation on the 8000 system yep. yep so and that's coming out uh you know how to quantify that is the big key you know so i spend twenty thousand dollars on this on this nice new yeah. inflation added system. feature yeah so what is that actually going to gain me that's what because I was... compaction is like we talked earlier i mean there's some years that you could run over it with a semi truck and you're probably not going to affect right. it. Right. right but then yeah. you've got other years where it's extremely wet or the soil conditions are such, or the weather conditions in general, then that might be a time when you say, okay, I put this on here and I gained, you know, it was wet last year. It was wet this year. I gained whatever percentage in, in yields. That might be a, that might be an option. Yeah. That when we originally put a schedule together to have a podcast on this topic come out during this time of the year, we wouldn't have imagined that we would be looking at the lowest amount of spring <laughs> rainfall we've received. Best thing about podcasts is this stays in a library and people can pick it up later and in the future because that, that's the point is we, we always want to try and help our listeners become better business owners and business operators. And if this is something that they can do, Maybe it is time to trade up on a tractor, and that's something that they can work at or, or include or, or put a package together. Yeah, you know, I, I, I use the analogy. You remember the my first vehicle was a 1978 uh, Ford Courier pickup, four-speed, 1.2, big 1.2 in it, hmm. but it had crank windows, right? All right, right. And then you got into the – buddy got this Cutlass or this old Cutlass, and it had the – remember the, the electric windows in it? Power remember windows. That? Oh, yeah. Power windows, and that was like the big thing, right? But nobody wanted to spend the money for power windows. Yeah. Well, now it costs you more to put a crank window. Crank in window. The, so that's what's going to that's going to be the progression of central inflation systems. Is okay. It's going to be costly, and you're going to have these guys that want to be the cutting edge guys out there that are are they got to have everything new and the latest and greatest, and they're going to improve on these things. And the efficiency and the of manufacture and costs and technology is going to go down, and they'll become more affordable. And I think in 
probably seven to ten years, it's going to be standard. Be on, standard. It will be a standard option on on uh, tractors. So now, if we have listeners that are, are thinking about this and reflecting on their own planter, their own setup, whatever it is, tillage tool, maybe they're thinking grain cart, and they continue to hear us talk about how once we get to the field, we can run on lower PSIs. Can you do this with any tire? Yes. So it doesn't have to be new technology. Nope. They don't have to go put a brand new set, a brand new tire on. Nope. This is something that they could do with any tire. And that's why I tell people that you don't need to run out and buy the latest and greatest technology like IF and VF because it's not practical uh, until you you can manage it. And even when you can manage it, it makes the conventional tires even more practical because now you're running, again, on a mechanical front wheel drive. Uh, well, we're in the process of setting up a, a compaction trial. We, I, I worked with Iowa State the last, well, three years uh, on different trials, and we've got one we're setting up. And uh, we were sending the, the professor or the engineer that we we're working with uh, inflation pressures of some typical setups. We're going to go, you know, our standard tires versus our LSW technology and uh, IF and VF and tracks. And when we were giving him the inflation pressures of the loads that he gave us, just because of the way the calculations of the load tables are, the conventional tires were actually at a lower inflation pressure planting than the IF and VF tires hmm. because the it's a numbers game, and I know we've made tires way more complicated than they needed to be, but under 10 miles per hour, conventional tires get a plus up in load carrying capacity. When you get that plus up, you can actually run lower inflation pressure, take advantage of that plus up, and you're running the same spot. IF and VF tires don't get a plus up. Right. So whatever they carry at 6 PSI uh, at 10 miles an hour is the same that they get at, or at 6 miles an hour is the same they get at 40 miles an hour. So it's kind of a numbers game. But that's just the way the, the, the business has turned into it. So going back to your point, if you did have a central inflation system or you did manage your, your tires on your, on your operation, you'll find that the stuff that you got on your tractors right now is, can do everything that an IF and VF tire can do at slower speeds. Where, honestly, where IF and VF tires come in to play, and not so much on the, the, you know, the planting tractor or whatever, but it's the, the applications where the tires are actually operating in the higher end of the of the inflation realm right so we're literally got a barely breath of air in a tractor tire right on a four-wheel drive or a mechanical front but if you look at you're talking about like a hagey self-propelled sprayer yep. the a 3090r46 is like the standard tire forever and the conventional tire on that runs at 78 psi that's where the gain can be had because now you can carry that same exact load, whether it's a 1,200-gallon tank or a 900, whatever the tank is, now you can carry that load at 20 40% less. So it takes you down from 78 PSI to 64 or even, you know. I was going to say, 50. I think we run our Hagee with a 1,200-gallon tank, and it's got those tires. I think it's Are like they 50, IFBF tires? Yes. Yep. I think it's like 56 or 58. Yep. It would be VF then. And, uh I and gotta, they're and they're good years, right? Ultra they are. Oh yeah, they're all. <laughs> I actually, I think, I think they actually are. But I have a good story on that. And I after this, I want to talk about load and inflation tables. But I have a good story on that. It was 2018, and we got 10 inches of rain in. I think we got in one day. I think Ankeny got 10 inches. Yeah, of rain. yeah, yeah. I remember. Yeah, I remember, yeah, yeah. remember that. Yeah, it was yeah. just Everybody's crazy. Everybody's basement. Got we flooded. got like 20, 30 inches of rain in the month of June, and we detasseled, cut tassels for a seed company. So it's time to go when it's time to go. Right. And we had our tires on our Hagee. No, nothing in the tank, but we had the cutter bar on the front. And we had those tires loaded up, and it it was after that three-inch event. And so it was just slop, and you had to go the next afternoon. And I got the load inflation tables out and figured out what the – we weighed our sprayer empty and, and, and full. Good and information um, to have. so we knew that and used that, and we were able to lower those tires down to, like, I don't know, it's like 30 PSI yep. or 28 PSI, something like that. And I have, I should dig them up. I got pictures of the treads before and after. Because before, when they were 58, probably just riding on a it little was like, patch like that. Yeah, it was yeah. like one, maybe one and a half treads on the ground. And then afterwards, it was yep. like a little mini track. I had like four or five treads yep. on the ground. Mm -hmm. And, and you, that's exactly that's exactly the point right there. And we were mm -hmm. able, after that three-inch rain, it was just slop out there. We were going through ponds and everything like that. And we stayed right on the row and were able to yep. did tassel like we wanted. So, so with that... Explain a load and inflation table because I knew nothing about that until we we started weighing tra tractors uh, probably five or six years ago. I used to have to get this big thick book out 
and find it in the manual and find your tire, but now you can go online and do it. Uh, there's all kinds of applications out there for uh, tire inflation pressures, uh, calculators, and um, yeah, so uh, load inflation tables when you say that. So I always tell, we, we've got this 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 organization it's called Tire and Rim Association that um, I call it a very large group of very smart people, and these guys sit around, it's a think tank, and they'll actually come up with these calculations of, you know, a uh, if it's a 480 ADR 30, what is the calculation to be able to calculate the loadout from everything from 6 PSI, which is the minimum for a radial tire, all the way up to whatever the load is. And, you know, the thing is, is people look at the side of the tire, right? The tire is low, right? Yeah. So what, is it, what, are the, what does the normal person do is they look at the side of the tire and it says max inflation 23 PSI or right. 43 PSI. Go right to it. You're describing, go, you're and, describing me right now. <laughs> <laughs> And they go right to that, but the thing is, is that tire is capable of probably handling twice the load that's on it, right? So if they would go to the uh, load inflation tables, they would see that instead of putting 43 in, well, I've only got, uh, you know, 5,000 per tire. I could be running at nine all day on that, but they, they don't do the, they don't do the, right. the homework and, and get in. I encourage everybody to go out, you know, whether it's ours or Bridgestones or Michelin's or who's ever website. Just type in tire pressure calculator, and it comes up. And um, there's a lot of good ones out there. We've got one on our website also. And um, you just punch in your size. It's pretty simple to use. You just punch in your size, your load, and it, and it comes up. You know, load is the, the key. I can swag you what a tractor weighs. You know, we have, I've got a group of uh, five field techs that do exactly yep. what you say is to go out and, and weigh up tractors. And that's an, a very important thing. And I encourage people that if... If you don't have those people around, um, you know, you could get a hold of us. But, you know, take it to a, a, a co-op or something that has a scale and understand what your axle load actually is because that tunes you into knowing exactly what you need to have. And just like you did with the sprayer, yeah. you can tune those tires uh, and, and just maximize your, your, your and, carrying capacity. And everyone is different. I mean, it, every, well, even when you change an implement, you know, yeah. and some guys put a bucket or a blade on the front. Yep. You some know, guys had it weighted different. Yep. You know, so. ballasting is, is yep. key too. So, so when you were talking about the study that you're working on with <laughs> Iowa State University, you threw out the LSW term. Could you define for our listeners who don't know what LSW is and what has that technology done for tractors, implements, combines, and soil compaction? Yeah, so um, LSW has been around since, uh, matter of fact, uh, I've been in the factory at, in Des Moines here for, well, since 95 and birth, built the first LSW, if you can believe it, in 97. So that's how long the technology is. And LSW stands for low sidewall. And essentially what we do is we take a standard conventional tire and we drop about 20% out of the sidewall, out of the standard tire. So the real first tire that we hit the ground run with was we took an 870R38, which is about 81 inches in diameter, uh, with a 38-inch uh, wheel. And we went to an 855-46. So same 81-inch outside diameter, but we, we shortened up. So you think about your pickup trucks, right? You know, back in the days, we had 15, 16-inch. You went to 17, 18 I've got 20s on my F-150 now, right? Yep. But the outside diameter hasn't really changed all that. It might, it's might have grown a little bit, but it's still remained the same. Mm -hmm. And there's a inherent performance enhancement that you get by by making that stability and that the uh, just the ride quality. Um, you know, the things that we get a lot is road lope and power hop are two big things because guys are going you know further and further these days. Yep. And there's nothing worse than sitting in a you know 54,000 pound four wheel drive bouncing basically bouncing off the road and you know it's a little unnervy so what happens is is in order to and I, I tell the story in order to solve that what you do is you actually inflate your tires a little bit more right if you think of those sidewalls as a spring right you got this big spring yep. well you're the stroke at that spring is so much and that's when you get this harmonic and then it just gets to the point where it almost throw you off the road right you gotta slow it yep guys so then they slow <laughs> it down they get the tires quieted down and then they take it back up again yep so to get out of that you just add air, you add air to the tires and it shortens those springs. Well, let's just say that guy just spent another $6,000 to put those fancy schmancy IFVF tires on, right? And he just put 10 pounds of air in to solve a, a common everyday issue of road lope, right? You think he's going to get to the field and let the air back out of those tires? And right. <laughs> not going to do, do it, right? So with the uh, LSW, we, we shortened that spring. So all of our uh, LSWs are actually VF technology. 
but you can keep the pressure down because we've already physically, because the tire is physically different, we shortened that spring. So you don't get that, that road lope. And then same with power hop, when you're hooking up, if you ever see a, uh, the slow motion of a dragster taking off, that tire and how it, it ripples yep. in. Wraps you know, it. Yep. Wrap, same thing happens with the tractor tire. So once it gets that load on it and it starts buckling, and then it lets loose, then you get this, this power hop. And again, what's happening is it's actually hooking up too well because it's, it's literally buckling that tire down and, and making it hop. So again, how you get out of power hop is you put air in the tires. And what it does, it creates more slip. Yep. You're not getting as much traction, so it's creating more slip, so you're not getting that that. Yeah, biting. I always just gear up or hit the throttle. <laughs> <laughs> yep. But again, going back to that, so this guy just spent all kinds of money on, on inflation technology just to get out of that, that issue, an everyday issue. He just lost everything that he thought he was paying for because of of that. So now we've got LSW technology that with that shorter sidewall, it, it doesn't buckle, and you can still run that lower inflation pressure. So we're kind of... We're kind of taking it kind of to the next level. So devil's advocate here. We have LSW next to, our, let's say, a regular four-wheel drive. Let's say it's on a four-wheel drive. I see it as a wider tire, but then also you've lowered the sidewall so your air chamber is smaller. Correct. Correct. So does that have anything to do with your performance in the field? Well, again, ours are VFs, so we can actually take it down to uh, a, a – we can – Run the same exact inflation pressures that an IF eight hundred set seventy R thirty eight. So your PSIs are the same. Yep. yep. Okay. Yep. So now, but if we go to a, a VF eight hundred seventy R thirty eight, then they've got us a few pounds per uh, PSI on on the inflation pressure advantage. But you know, mostly eight hundred seventy thirty eights are on your four wheel drives. Yep. And um, it, it's kind of funny, but you know, people kind of fall for it, but. You know, there's manufacturers, a couple in Iowa, you know, one up kind of where I went to school at, yeah. right, up there that uh, they offer a, a IF technology on a 870-38 on a four-wheel drive tractor. And four-wheel drive, let's say a 9570, comes in about, you know, 54 to 55,000 pounds. You got about 30,000 on the front, 20,000 on the rear. And if you did just exactly what you did and looked up the tables, you would find that unless he's got some big saddle tank operation or some something crazy, yep. which happens, yep. uh, you could literally run those same uh, the conventional tires at six psi in the rear and eight psi in the uh, front all day, same as the IF tires. Yep. But this guy just spent, you know, I think it was six seven thousand dollar upgrade to get this IF technology, and. He's not going to run one psi less than than the conventional tire. So right. knowing knowing that technology again, you know the thing to think about is on the IF side of it. Unless you got a central inflation system, the only advantage would be is when you're transporting, you can actually set them up to run a little bit lower. But you're still not going to get down to your optimum in the field conditions when you're in a like a planting situation. Right. Um, with the conventional tires, again. At those higher, like your sprayer, that's where IF and VF really come in. So if somebody's really, you know, thinking about getting into IF and VF and this type of thing, you know, you need to look at the applications, your combines, yeah. right? Those, you know, you got cyclic and the VFs do get, uh, they call it CFO. So it, you'll see it's IF or VF CFO, which is cyclic field operation. That's what that CFO stands for. And what that does is when you do get under 10 miles per hour in a cyclic application where it's you start out empty and you're traveling at a relatively slow rate of speed it usually t less than 10 miles per hour that that tire slowly gains up you know the the hopper fills up yep. and you get to max inflation and then or max load and then you offload yep and that's 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 the cyclic okay. right so if and vf tires actually get a a 55 percent i have to get a 55 percent plus up from the load carrying capacity of the tire just multiply it by 1.55 of whatever the max load was, and that's yep. the carrying capacity. So that's and those are significantly lower than a, a conventional tire. Yeah, and I would say that's probably the heaviest thing going through the field. It's the right. combine and the grain cart. Yep, absolutely. <clears throat> so if you're going to compare straight across now, say either a, a we'll do a John Deere 8400R mechanical front tractor set up on row crop duels. Okay, 
because I don't know the numbers, how to spot them off. 488 AR-50. Yep. <laughs> or now set up on LSWs. 1100s. So that would be the that would be the combination that, uh, and actually you can get it out of Waterloo now, is the mm-hmm. uh, 1145 R46 rear and 1000 40 R32 front. Okay. What and that I... front tire, just so you guys know, that was actually, uh, we make the sprayer tire for Terrigator up oh. in Jackson. Oh. Okay. So that's a, the, actually a 1050 25 that we dropped a 32 inch wheel in. So okay. we made it a low sidewall. But it's, <laughs> you know, so you take these over the fields all day, every day, right? right. Floating across. The, yeah. So yeah. that's. Okay. Now they've got what we call the mini quads, where these 8400Rs are set up on tracks RX. all the way around. RX. So you put those three side by side comparisons, inflated properly. Obviously, tracks doesn't matter. What are we looking? What are we, valve stems. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are we looking at for compaction comparisons? Um, you know, I have actually done not so much. I haven't got my hands on a on an eight R yet, or eight R X, uh, but I'm working on that. But I did do it on a ninety six twenty R and R X. And so what we actually have is a a pad in the in the plants for our engine, uh, engineering. So what it is is it's a electronic pr- pressure pad, and if you stood on that. You could, I could tell you exactly, exactly what uh, your ground bearing pressure is mm-hmm. of the, your heel versus your toe. It, you'd have this really cool picture of your yep. shoe, right? It's like Doctor Scholl pad. <laughs> <for, for laughs> <tractors. laughs> Literally, that's exactly yeah. what it is. That's exactly what it is. So, but in a little bit larger scale. Yeah. So what we did is we actually uh, set up an R and an RX, one with our fourteen hundred uh, thirty forty six, which right now is the largest ag tire in the world, and the thirty six inch track. And what we did is we we had to ballast the hell out of the R machine because that RX is so much heavier just without hanging another piece of iron on it. So we were throwing weight on that 9620R, and then we set it down on the pad. And on this image, there was a very uniform, kind of a bluish purple type of uniform uh, distribution of the of the, the load. And I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but... It was a very, and you would expect that for a tire, right? Because it's a, it's an air chamber, so it will distribute the load. Yeah. So the darker the colors on that, the the less compact or compaction, but less ground bearing pressure was. But when I dropped the RX on it, sat it down, it was really dark blue, green red, really dark blue, green red or uh, yellow red, really dark blue for each of the rollers and the. <clears throat> so that load has to be carried someplace, right? Yep. You know. I always say there's a difference between flotation and compaction, right? Everybody thinks that you slap a set of tracks on your you know, on your grain cart or on your tractor that you instantly have less compaction. And that's not necessarily true because those mas- machines are substantially heavier and it has to be carried someplace. Flotation, what I tell people, flotation is you throw a piece of cardboard on a mud puddle, right? You're going to walk across it, yep, no. <laughs> right? You walk across it, you don't sink into that mud puddle, do you? But think about what's happening to the mud right underneath your foot right that's flotation compaction is where your foot is so the actual ground bearing pressure of a track machine in that case was uh right underneath the mid rollers and it was almost 40 percent more ground bearing pressure underneath the mid rollers than it was across the entire face of the of the tire Hmm. and that's just where we get to the discussion that we had earlier where is it the duration you know, going right. across that. Right. So you've got the track that's actually on the, the ground longer, longer in that spot, mm-hmm. and you've got two really heavy spots through that. That would be an argument that probably from a compaction standpoint. And, you know, um, if you didn't know, I used to work at Firestone. So yeah. uh, Firestone did a study here now probably eight, nine years ago where they actually buried a same thing, a, a pad underneath the ground, and they did these trials. And... Their final result was that properly inflated tire actually has less compaction than, uh, at that time, it was a, a twin track or dual track machine on it. So, and we kind of replicated that, if you will. Right. But um, there's no doubt that, a, you know, a, a track machine is designed to pull. And that's where it came out of was the construction, you know, the quad track yeah. came out. And that's where it was. But guys don't like it. Uh, they get into tracks because they don't like power hop. And they don't like road load. Of course... You can only go 18 miles an hour or 19 miles an hour in a, in a quad track, and you can chip them and never that, but uh, road speed on a 
a wheeled machine is, you know, 24, 26.4 or, or whatever it is, um, there's a big difference in the initial, you know, purchase price of that. So you start throwing all this stuff in there, and now the tires are getting so big that we're actually kind of matching the flotation side of it. Yeah, right. So that's where people have really kind of picked up on on that concept of that super single that super single uh, concept. So, so Goodyear makes tracks, don't they? We do not. You do not. Uh, okay. Not our division. When for those that don't know that you know the Titan actually owns Goodyear Farm Tire. Okay. So we don't have anything to do technically with uh, Goodyear, you know, light truck. Uh, medium light truck or uh, passenger light truck. We bought the that circle or the the triangle that says Goodyear Farm Tires. The client. And the, now, if you look at the tires or you look at our symbol, it says "Made by Titan" underneath there. So we don't have anything to do with tracks. We don't have anything to do with the blimp. We we just <laughs> basically I forgot pay. about the blimp. How could I have forgotten about the blimp? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we just pay a licensing fee for the for the for the wing foot. So we're wholly owned by. It's wholly owned by Titan, but we just have to pay the licensee fee for the for the brand name. So, so it's just your brand, right? Yep. So but we have all the control on engineering and all the manufacturing and, and all that. Is we got a factory, and the nice part is, is we got a factory in Des Moines, Iowa, Freeport, Illinois, and Bryan, Ohio. We everything that's made for North America is made in North America. So we're very proud of that fact too. So mm-hmm. there may be better than one year then. <laughs> oh, good one! You know, I always get to tell people. I said, if I had a if I had a dime for every time I heard that, I would be sipping margaritas and pina coladas on a beach down in Mexico. But uh, well, you good. know, and I'll be honest. You know, there, everybody has issues, and uh, um, you know, I was at Firestone, and uh, you were always wondering why the guys over at Goodyear were you know doing so well. And it's just the world that you live in, and. The thing for us is is it's how you take care of those issues, and that's why we've got our, our field techs, our ag specialists out there running and, and helping people. And a lot of times, just like we were talking about, you know, oh, this tire is riding crappy or it's it's something's wrong, and it just might be a, a ballasting issue or an inflation. You know, everything goes to the tires, right? Because right. you can have the biggest motor and the nicest transmission, but if you don't have tires on the thing, it's not going anywhere. It's just a big lump of steel. Yep. So tires are the first one if you're having a performance issue that people look to, and a lot of times it's it might be a tire issue, but a lot of times uh, uh, it could be ballast, it could be inflation, it could be a lot of different things. And so that's what we kind of do is get out and, and really help the end user has a, have a successful experience with the, with the product. So then for our listeners, what would you say is coming down the pipe? Or what can you share with us is coming down the pipe for technology? What, what's going to be the next biggest thing? Well, you know, I think t- there's only so many things you can do with an air chamber. You know, uh, you think about how you can have a, a more flexible tire or... or but you got to have a chamber and you got to have air and you got to have a wheel to hold that. Now there's there's technology out there that uh, it's a pneumatic track by uh, actually it was a Mitas Trailerborg uh, technology where it's essentially a it's a pseudo well you've seen the uh, twills yeah on yeah. lawnmowers okay lawnmower so t- twill technology we've kicked it around I mean uh, that's a pretty application specific because to be honest you think about it a load load doesn't really change a lot on a lawnmower. Yeah, I mean, yep. A guy might have a big breakfast or something, yeah. but, but other than that, it really is pretty. It's pretty stable, so you can you can tune those the fins and those twills to be able to to be able to manage it. But you think about just like we were talking, you got a tire on there, or a, a let's say a, a non pneumatic type of system on your tractor, and you go from ten thousand pounds and you throw a planter on it. Now you're up to twenty thousand pounds. That tire you can't adjust the. So now you're just grinding it into the ground. Yep. Um, so it, it's very difficult in ag because there's just such a fluctuation of of the applications and, and what yeah implements behind impl- whether you're going to carry on the three point or, yep. exactly exactly. So it makes a lot of sense. But uh, you know, I, I see um, for us and what we're gearing up for, and not only on the tires, but for us for the wheel side because you got to have a way on these uh, central inflation systems to get the air into the tire. So the valving for the the hole and the punch in another valve hole in it you know we've worked you know when we work with deer on their system so we're already kind of getting into it there's a lot of aftermarket stuff out there that you have to modify your wheels to get into it mm-hmm. um i see for us at least for the next five seven years it's going to be working with people on central inflation systems and and just educating people on just proper inflation pressure taking the technology that we already have and using it to its level right yeah. so because now you're getting to the point where uh you don't have to make that compromise of having to run 23 psi mm-hmm. while you're in the most delicate you're in the most delicate stage of the whole thing you're putting it in ground 
and you're overinflated. Now, if you got the central inflation systems, then you can drop it down and you can take full advantage of whatever that tire has to offer. I got one off that. So our tires still being made is so fast that you need to take them off and cure them, cure them for a year. I hear that all the time. That, that, that's a good one. That's great, actually. Uh, <laughs> but no, actually, no. So where that came from was, is, you know, people literally like right now, right? Uh, product is at, in short demand. We're trying to hire, if anybody's out there, we're trying to hire people to at the manufacturing, manufacturing facilities here in Des Moines and in Freeport. But um, they're going so fast and they're going literally from the curing press to the back of the trailer in probably less than, you know, three, four hours. That's how quickly stuff's moving. And what you're saying is, is, you know, letting tires cure and rubber never stops curing. The chemical process that's in there, you never use up all the curatives, sulfur and a couple other things, but sulfur is the main one that allows those polymer chains to actually cross-link. You know, uh, Charles Goodyear didn't build one tire. Um, he invented the vulcanization process, but he didn't build a tire. So uh, that's where we got our name. But um, vulcanization is the, the connecting this cross-linking of rubber polymer chains. So, and you use different chemicals to do that. And in a curing press, you take it up to whatever, 330 uh, degrees and it sits in there depending it's like a tur- uh, Christmas turkey you know the bigger the the turkey the longer and cooler you got to have it you don't want it crispy outside and all frozen on the inside so you got to have a longer cooler bake on it same thing with tires but that that cure rate never stops and those those chemicals never stop reacting in the tire so when it leaves the door we're at you know, a short durometer, our short durometers, well, you stick anybody's tire, we're in that 68 to 72 range short durometer, and it goes out to the field. Now, to your point, you know, people say, well, I'm going to buy a set this year and set it in the, well, have you ever put a, a pencil, like an old, the old wooden number two pencil in your desk, right? Yeah. Right? And it sits in there, because whoever uses a number two wooden pencil anymore, I don't even know if you have a sharpener, but you, <laughs> sometimes you need an eraser. I think I know where you're going, though. yeah, the right. eraser on it. Right, so you... A year later, you need a, You got your mechanical pencil. You lost your eraser on it, so you grab that, right? And you go to erase with it. What happens? It's hard, hard and crunchy, yeah. right? So what do you do? You kind of I don't know. I, at least I do. Is you I peel, peel the bit. peel the crust off it, and it's still gooier on the inside. So maybe that's what they're talking about. Is that's it? exactly what they're talking yeah. about because it's going to be. It will be because um, time, temperature, and pressure is what causes uh, tires to cure. Yeah. So. You may not have any, you know, you got, you know, 14.2, 14.3, uh, you know, bar or pounds per square inch atmospheric pressure. And maybe you got it sitting in a hot shed. There's a little temperature. So it keeps those those chemicals activated and it does get harder. Um, now you let them set too long because you can go too hard, right? Yeah. Then you start getting, you know, cracking at the base of the lug and right. other, other issues. So people keep coming up to us about stubble as another one. And, uh. You know, what I would encourage growers and producers to do is, you know, if you're thinking about it, and if these guys hold on to their tractor tire, you know, the tractors for more than, say, five years, they'll replace the front tires on those tractors probably three to one to the rears. Okay. And why is that? Because the, the front tires are taking all the hit on the on the stubble, right? Yep. So if they would just invest in a set of, well, maybe Devastators or Stalk Stompers Stop. on, a, yep. on a combine, or uh, there's some pretty neat stuff for tractors like rollers yep. that you would literally save all that money on three sets of tires and it would be you know to me that's that's smart money there yep. but and with all this technology comes the price tag so yep. the, the tires have yeah. gone up just as much no as the, I, I, we're, <laughs> we're giving them away oh is that okay okay <laughs> well good so as we get ready to wrap up is there anything you think we missed today that would be good for our listeners to hear no, you know, I, uh, again, you know, technology has been out there. I have and VF have been out there for, it's going on 20 years. That's how long it's been out here. But you're just now starting to see it on the on the machines coming. And people still don't understand it. Um, I would say that if you got questions, contact your, your tire dealer, uh, whoever you use. Don't overlook that, the tires, because they do make a difference. Just like with your sprayer uh, thing. Makes a huge difference in performance, ride, ride comfort. Um, it's just the one thing that everybody overlooks, and it is kind of a pain in the butt. And it, it's just time consuming, and it's not really cool. And I mean, I'd rather 
you know, hook up to some big planter and hooking hoses up than, you know, putting air in tires. Yeah, hooking hoses up <laughs> isn't very fun either unless you got outback wraps. There you yeah. go. Yeah. <laughs> so we ask all of our guests the same question. We always ask you to ponder what the most successful farmers you've met or networked with, what they all have in common. So be thinking about that. Corey, I'm going to jump in and try and summarize what we chatted about today, and I'll have you challenge, challenge. Our, our listeners this week. But we had Scott Sloan in here. He was here to talk to us about the tire technology and its relation to soil compaction. We started off with the general definition of soil compaction, but we all understand that uh, once we have compacted soils, we have very limited yield potential in those areas. So our goal is to try and make that compaction the least amount possible. Uh, we learned about IF and VF, tire technology, correct, Scott? Uh, and how those have been available to hey, can us. I, can I, uh, I'm going to quiz you. How's oh, that? Geez. <laughs> this what is dangerous. Is, what does IF stand for? I should remember. I don't, it's escaping me. I wow. Right now, what's the, running through where's my. The, where's my red pencil? Uh, the VF is very <laughs> flexion. Very high flexion. Very high yep. flexion in yep. the. Yep. In, in, what did the IF stand for? Increased. Increased flexion. Increased flexion. Yep. Sorry to put you Sorry to put you on the spot there. But I know if I didn't. Our listeners are in the same position trying to remember what that what that was. Because I was, in my head, envisioning what you were talking about with the cords inside the tire for radials and by. So mm-hmm. uh, that's where my mind directly went. So that's very helpful in the summarization. We do know that our implements aren't getting any lighter. But we do know that there is ability there with the inflation technology. And like you were sharing, Corey, the, the load tables load and inflation tables to be able to do our research and take the existing tires that we have and put them to their highest and best use. Uh, we have people in our networks that we can refer to to help us with those calculations or come weigh our equipment if we need to. And it was interesting to learn that there is a various um, various different uses and benefits from tire technology versus track technology, and then also these load inflation systems that are coming down the pipeline right. to where we can adjust from road to field. Uh, ultimately the tire technology, like you said, there's only so much we can do with an air chamber, but we are doing what we can to be able to spread that out. It reduces as much compaction as possible, as well as continuing to op- optimize the performance in the field. Right. And that's the, that, and that is the, the tires size aren't really changing. It's just trying to get the maximum you can out of those, out of the tires that you already have. And I always tell people, don't run out and buy all the new tires, just maximize what you got and you're, you're going to be well ahead of the game. Yep. And then look at getting a source of helium because that obviously <laughs> Ooh, uh, through that. Would yeah, we've actually talked about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. So that, that was a, a very quick summary on what we talked about today. Pretty much covered everything that you wanted to or didn't want to know about tires and the technology that's available down the road. Who knows where we're headed? Could we be working on um, a twheel type technology? Could it be just non-pneumatic? Yep, non-pneumatic hoverboard. <laughs> hover, oh, yep, so hover technology. Yeah. We've got a lot of different options there. Uh, but before Corey challenges our listeners, were you able to think the most successful farmers that you've networked with? What do they all have in common? Really successful ones are, first of all, they're usually like great guys, like really nice guys. And the thing that makes them, I think, nice is that they're willing to listen, right? And they're willing to, you know. Why are you doing it that way? You know, they're willing to, to look at themselves and their operations to see what they can, you know, what they're doing wrong and what they're, and the, the big part is, is they're willing to try it. They're, they're willing to take that change and they encourage and they, they seek out new technologies just like tractors and planters and, and they're not scared to take that chance and invest mm-hmm. in that, in that technology. So that's to me, and like I said, they always seem like they're just the, Nicest, nicest guys. Yep. I like that. Good people. Yep. Yeah, they are. Willing to think outside the box a little bit. Yep. Yeah. So. All right, Corey, challenge our listeners, and we'll close this out. Yeah, I got a, a two-part challenge. It's something that I did a few years ago when we were actually getting into the, learning about the load and inflation tables, was I took an inventory on all of our tires. You know, a lot of people do that for all of your equipment, and you know, kind of know, you get a spreadsheet for, for what you have, but, you know, a field cultivator could have 12 tires on it. You know, so, and, and two different sizes, the inner frame and the outer frame. So like yep. having that on a spreadsheet is really easy when you have an issue and you can refer back to that and you can call your tire guy and say, hey, I got this tire and you know exactly what it is. You're not trying to call the hired guy to go figure it out or anything like that. So that's my first one. And the second one is get with your tire guy. If they don't have scales, they can call Scott or someone like that to get you scales because it doesn't have to be something that you do for every implement, but when you get a guy out there with scales, you can load that. You can you can get your tractor axle weight and then 
put, you know, divide that by your tires. Then you can do it with the planner on. And you can do, I mean, you can do several different implements and kind of know. It, you know, gives, obviously, you, it gives you a baseline. Yeah. Obviously, you know, when that yep. grain cart is half full, how, how sure. heavy that is. Sure. If you have the, the weight of that cart when it's empty, you can do the math there and figure out and use those loaded inflation tables. Go online. Every company has one and optimize it because it's going to help you agronomically and economically. You know, and there's certain situations for, you know, guys like planter tractors, right? They pull every piece of iron off of that tractor to lighten it up, yep. right? And uh, their inflation pressure could be dropped, you know, knowing what that axle load is, you know, you have your spring inflation pressures. And then when you get into heavy tillage, then they throw all the cast back on and, and really load that thing up. Well, you gotta have to adjust that because you could be doing some damage to that, right. and, yep. and it helps with the right. performance of that. Good. I think those were very good challenges, yeah. Corey. So, Scott, if our listeners want to get a hold of you or find you on social media, how can they do that? Well, uh, social media, you can get me at uh, on Twitter, just Scott Sloan six one six four, and um, you know, I would encourage everybody to go to our. We got a great YouTube uh, channel. Just Google Goodyear Farm Tire YouTube, and there's dozens, if I would not say hundreds, of videos of LSW technology and, and just the latest and greatest stuff. Um, and then, obviously, our website, we can uh, tighteninternational.com uh, is where to go on that. So Fantastic. Um, well, again, thank you very much, Scott, for popping up here. Remember, listeners, that uh, we've got financial support from BW Fusion. They're focused on bringing innovative fertility, nutritional, and other technologies to the ag marketplace. They combine their best-in-class products along with their 365 soil and tissue program to provide you the best tools necessary to address the limiting factors in real time in your soil. Remember to like, rate, review, and share this podcast with your friends. Go out there to our website and see what's hanging out there for now. But until next time, have a good one. Remember, if you aren't farming for profit, you won't be farming for long.